Well, good morning, everyone. We're here at the Maple Ridge Center at the Snow Tubing Hill. And once again, checking out our level of snow, which is getting down toward the bottom of the stick. And as you look over here toward the hill, most of the snow is now going. And with the warm spell that we're going to have here for the next few days, I'm guessing even more of this will be gone. The fields are starting to lose their snow cover. The green grass is uh, showing through, or at least the brown grass for now. And it's going to be a busy sugaring weekend. The sap is running. And here we are two weeks before Easter. What's it going to look like on Easter? Let's talk about Easter, shall we? So, here I am in the church parking lot on what we call the Lowville side, bringing you online service number 54. That's right. It's been a year and two weeks now that we have not been meeting inside and that we have been bringing you online services. We did meet a couple times inside the church building in October. We also had some outdoor meetings at the Maple Ridge Center for five or six weeks, but we still have not reopened to have public services inside. That yellow sign that you can see in the door over there, stating that we're not having services currently, that you can check online on YouTube at 10.30 a.m. to find us, that has been hanging there for almost six months now. And as I said, it's been over a year that we started offering online services. So we thought that Easter morning, two weeks from now, what a perfect time to open up the church and celebrate the most significant spiritual day of the year for Christianity. However, there are some logistical issues. First of all, how many people can we hold? What if we have too many and we won't be able to all be seated in the sanctuary? Secondly, there are some uh, there's a considerable amount of work yet going on with the sound system and the video system that we're hoping to complete and two weeks from now is just a little bit of a stretch to try and get that done in that length of time. However, we do want to do something special for Easter. So here is the current plan that we are going to have a sunrise service right here where I'm standing at 7 a.m. on Easter morning. The cars will come in from where you are. You can park right here facing this way. The sun actually rises prior to 7 a.m., but it rises right over that direction across the lake or across the uh, across the Black River, so we'll be able to see it. And at 7 a.m., uh, we will celebrate with the service taking place right in this area on this side of the church. And then at 8 a.m., there is going to be a pancake breakfast with eggs and sausage and a fruit cup and a juice box and that pure new northern New York maple syrup. That will happen at 8 o'clock. So there is going to be something special happening here at Easter morning, but it will not be happening inside the building. Uh, it will be a drive through area right there, the way we've done the past things that we've done here at the church. And then hopefully we will get the recording of the service from 7 a.m. uploaded in time so that those of you who can't be here can watch it at 10.30 a.m. on Easter morning. So when will we be meeting in the church again? Well, the church council is meeting on Monday evening, March 29th, and we will talk about it there and hopefully have an announcement for you. We are still aiming for some time in April to be able to meet inside the church again. Our call to worship this morning is from one of the passages that a professor of mine at Houghton College called one of the most significant of any in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. I will read the opening statements and then the words will come up that you can either read out loud or simply contemplate them as they come onto the screen. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with Israel. I will be their God and they will be my people. We trust you, God, to forgive our iniquities and remember our sin no more. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, knowing that those who love their life will lose it. And let us all read together, we call out to you as you call us to deeper growth. Blessings to you as you worship with us for the rest of this service.
skies for the love which from our birth over and around us lies lord of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night hail and veil and tree and flower sun and moon and stars of light lord of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the joy of ear and eye for the heart and mind's delight for the mystic harmony linking sense to sound and sight lord of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the joy of human love brother sister parent child friends on earth and friends above for the gentle thoughts and mild lord of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the church that evermore lifteth holy hands above offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love lord of all to this our hymn of grateful praise. Good morning. Did you know that yesterday was the first day of spring? It is not necessarily feeling like spring. It's a little chilly still, but that's what the calendar says. Springtime is when we think of putting new plants and seeds into the ground and watching for little shoots of the plants that come up year after year. I had a Zoom meeting a few weeks ago with a group of my cousins. Six of them live in Nebraska, three in Missouri, one in Indiana, and I live in New York. We got together on March 1st and they were talking about seeing their tulips and plants come up out of the ground and doing work in their yards and gardens and how exciting it was that spring was finally here. I said, we still have two feet of snow on the ground. And they said the temperature that day at their places was in the 60s and some had the 70s. I said we had a high of 25 degrees. That made me a little bit jealous. We know that eventually spring does come to northern New York. We just need to wait a little bit longer. And maybe we appreciate it more because we do need to wait a bit longer. The snow is gradually going away, but since I can't go out and dig in the dirt yet, I'm going to try planting some beautiful flowers inside. So I have this vase with dirt. I think that's probably about enough dirt. Maggie gave me these flower seeds for Christmas and I have been waiting to plant them. So this will be good. I'm so anxious to see how these seeds will grow and what the flowers will look like. So there I have a few on there. Then I put just a little bit more dirt on top of those seeds so they can come through. It seems a little bit bare or boring, so I have this. I thought I'm going to decorate it a little bit. I have this yarn. Evelyn and Valerie love to play with this yarn. Now, it also needs water. So, I'm watering that. And now, let's see here. Where would those plants come? Well, I'm so looking forward to showing them to you, but 
I don't see any flowers yet. Do you know why not? Hmm, you're right. I put all of these things up on top and that took away all the water. You would think I would be smart enough to know that seeds won't grow if the water can't get to them. Them not being patient, I should be wise enough to remember that it takes a while for seeds to sprout and grow. See there, that's better. Now I can water it. There we go, there's some water. We sometimes can be like these little seeds. All those things, this yarn and cotton that I put on top are like when we hold on to anger or unforgiveness or bad feelings, that stops us from growing into who God is calling us to be. As children of God, God is calling each of us to be more loving and kind and fair. We won't really sprout green leaves or have flowers growing out of our heads. But when we choose to forgive instead of being unforgiving, or when we choose to love instead of holding on to anger and bad feelings, we are growing more and more into who we are supposed to be. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and help us to learn how to let go of those bad feelings and grow into the people you are calling us to be. Amen! Back here once again inside the church where I don't have to contend with wind and traffic noise. It's always very quiet here in the sanctuary when we do these recordings. No one here. Empty. As it will be in the tomb in two weeks and we will celebrate that. Did you notice that when I was reading that scripture during the call to worship that when I held up the page, the sunlight reflecting from the page came up and lit my face up, and then when I put it down, the shadows came over it again. That was not on purpose. That's just kind of an interesting thing that happened. And to me, the lesson there is the illumination of Scripture in our daily lives. First of all, that significant passage from Jeremiah about just how important this new covenant is that God is going to make with us through his son Jesus and secondly, a couple of verses also in that call to worship from the book of John that show some of the sacrifices that we need to make if we're truly going to have deep growth. So as we enter into this pastoral prayer time this morning, I ask you to think of some of the things, some of the sacrifices you've had to make over the past year and two weeks, some of the things you've had to give up, what kind of year that it's been. For some, this has been one of the most difficult years of their lives. For others, it hasn't been that bad. In fact, in some ways, it's kind of been good, depending on what your situation is. Everyone is in a different place. But one thing is for sure, that during times like this, God calls us to deep growth, and we have lots of opportunities for that. So two weeks prior to Easter, in this last week here before Palm Sunday, let us reflect on these words of confession and assurance from our text this morning as provided for us from Mennonite Church USA. And these should sound familiar because we've been saying some of these same prayers for the last five weeks now. 
Deep calls to deep. We call to you from the depths of our hearts. We confess our resistance to being planted into your aching earth, into the way of your covenant. We confess our need for you to plant within us the joy of your salvation, a willing spirit. And right at this point, we're being asked to think of some of the forces that have kept us from deep growth over the past year. Contemplate on that a little bit. Deep calls to deep. You call us from the depth of your love, calling us to deep growth. We come to you, O God. Amen. You're the Word of God, the Father, from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord. the land. Yet you left the gaze of angels, came to seek and save the lost, and exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a word you still the sea. Yet how silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the Lord of everyone, and your cry of love rings out across the land. With a shout you rose victorious, wresting victory from the grave, and ascending into heaven, leading captives in your wake. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own, from each tribe and tongue and nation. You are leading children home. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of everyone. And your cry of love rings out across the land. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of everyone. And the cry of love rings out across the land. Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Zare, and I'm the conference minister for New York Mennonite Conference. I'm coming to you this morning from my office, which is where I've been working for these last 12 months. And you'll notice over my shoulder this banner that we received from Mennonite Central Committee. The year 2020 was a significant anniversary. It has been 100 years that Mennonite Central Committee has been serving the world in the name of Christ. These banners came out to the area conferences of Mennonite Church USA in appreciation for all of the congregations and individuals for their support over a century of doing good in the world for Jesus. Now we've arrived at Lent week five and our text this morning is coming from Jeremiah chapter 31. If you'd like to turn in your text, read along with me. The title of my message this morning is Contracts and Covenants. Read the words of Scripture with me. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. 
This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel at that, after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors and say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So this week has been recognized in our area as a, a one-year anniversary of sorts. It was around this time last year when the reality of COVID-19 hit us where we live. I remember hearing people at that time speak of a couple of weeks or a month to get past this viral sickness. In that language, I recognized our cultural tendency to believe that we are capable of controlling and conquering anything. Now, a whole year later, we are clearly in the now but not yet of COVID-19. Vaccines are up and hospitalizations are down. Hope is stirring as we emerge from winter, but we also recognize that we're not done yet. There are variants of the virus that remain unknown quantities. And while we often think only in terms of the United States, the virus is worldwide and access to the vaccine is vastly diverse. We simply don't know even now after a year how this will ultimately play out. Now, don't get me wrong, we should be hope-filled, and yet we should also be sober about the ongoing challenge. This, for me, is a reminder of our journey through Lent. We live in a now-but-not-yet kingdom. In Jesus, the kingdom of God has come near to us, and yet, it isn't fully arrived. That day is still in our future and we await it with hope, all the while sober about the ongoing challenge of living in a broken world. We live in both and rather than either or. The kingdom has come and the kingdom is coming. It is now and it is not yet. Perhaps there's no better reminder for us than our text from Jeremiah this morning. This reading is one of several covenantal readings throughout Scripture. Now the word covenant is deeply biblical, and it describes both who God is and how God acts. God acts towards God's creation in covenantal ways. And those covenantal ways help us to know God's character. They go together. And yet we live in a culture that actually undermines our ability to live into covenantal language because our world is almost fully a contract world. Now this is what I will be tracing out for the next bit. When it comes to our engagement with the scriptures, we do well to not get too lost in the fragments. By that, I mean to say that a significant part of our life in the Bible is done in small segments. We pull out several verses each day or on any given Sunday, as we've done today, we've only looked at four verses of scripture in order to examine them. Now, this is a worthy discipline, one we definitely should continue. But at the same time, something also comes alive when we pay attention to the larger sweep of Scripture, the bigger story as it unfolds, the context out of which the specifics emerged. And in the case of covenants, this richness holds true. Now, I don't have enough time to trace each of the ancient covenants, so I will necessarily leave that to you to pursue. 
But let's name a few. What are the covenants in Scripture? I'm going to do just a little quiz here this morning. I'm going to read you just a section of a covenant, and I'll give you just a, I'll pause and give you just a second to answer it to your, for yourselves. Which covenant is this one? I have set my bow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Okay, that covenant is after the flood, and it's the one that God made in front of Noah and his family. How about this one, second one? Very familiar. I will make you a great nation. What covenant is that one? Okay, we call that one the Abrahamic Covenant. It is the covenant that God made with Abraham. Here's a third one, a little bit later in the text. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people, and they said, We will do everything the Lord has said. Okay, that one was maybe a little bit harder. That one was the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai. That comes out of the book of Exodus. Okay, here's a fourth one. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Which covenant is that? That's the covenant that God made with King David. And then we read today's out of Jeremiah, a new covenant, one that is going to be written on our minds and our hearts. And then there's one left. And we're going to get there in just a moment. But I want you to recognize all of these covenants that are throughout Scripture as Scripture continues to unfold. So what is happening? Why are there so many covenants? Is it because God has to shift gears and make new plans? Is it because one hits its expiration date requiring that a new one be instituted? Actually, what is happening in these covenants is that we could see them better rather than sequentially. We would, could see them better as piling up one on top of another. Nothing is being replaced, but something is taking shape. With each covenant, God is becoming more intimate and God is becoming more vulnerable. Each of the previous covenants are included, but they are also transcended. That's the direction of biblical covenants and a revelation into God's character, what God is like. Now, what is remarkable about this is that God isn't the one who breaks God's covenants. Humanity does that. God's response to our breaking of a covenant is to come nearer to us, to take more responsibility for us, not less. And perhaps by now your mind is taking you to this one final covenant. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do you recognize those words? There is nothing that is more intimate. There is nothing that is more vulnerable than God taking on human flesh and willingly to suffer and die because our response to God's covenants is to break them. 
in each of the covenants that we've named, God is the primary actor. God is the initiator, not us. We are only invited to participate in God's covenants, which are irrevocable. They are never removed. Now, David Boshar, president of Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, says it this way, God enters into our situation and closes the exit door, saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But we are Western American capitalistic Christians in the 21st century. Our world is not a world of covenants. Our world is a world of contracts. And contracts are not the same because contracts are based on two things, self-interest and having an exit door. Contracts are always conditional. Both parties take great lengths to define nuanced expectations. And if either party breaches these often highly detailed expectations, the contract is voidable. Now, contracts are grounded in mutually beneficial exchanges. If you've ever taken a mortgage out to buy a home, how many times did you have to write your signature? Was it a dozen? Was it two dozen or even more? Now think about this. How many signatures did it take to buy the property? Only one. All of the rest outlined the way in which the mutually beneficial exchange was defined if one or the other party chose to leave it or if one or the other party broke it. The culture in which we live is almost entirely contractual, and we are impacted by it within the church. Many of us entered into a marriage covenant in an ornate church service where we made covenantal vows. But think about it. If that is to go away, where does it happen? Well, it happens in a secular court of law where contracts are broken. Many of us, too, have made baptismal vows that are covenantal vows. And then we give voice to the necessity for the church to meet our needs and our expectations. Or, if it gets really difficult, we head for the exit. Now, I say these things not to hurt anyone's feelings. That's the last point that I want to make. What I'm trying to say is that living out covenants in our broken world and in our sinful limitations as humans is a great challenge. But I do want us to observe and think carefully about how deeply we are influenced by contracts rather than covenants. Our culture has set itself up with exit doors accessible in every possible way. While God enters into our situation and closes the exit door behind him, and then to top it all off, Jesus has the gall to ask us to act that way toward each other. In John chapter 13, Jesus says this, a new command I give you, love one another. Now here's the kicker, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is where the trajectory of biblical covenantal language leads us. God initiates the relationship, God makes it permanent, and then God invites us to enter into God's love in such a way that our mind and our heart is transformed. That transformation causes us to love each other as Christ has loved us. 
That transformation causes us to love our neighbors as ourselves. It causes us even to love our enemies and pray for those who are against us, even persecute us. Now, our ability, or might I say inability, to live up to this profound invitation does not change the covenant. Instead, God just comes closer and closer and closer to us. One week from today begins Holy Week. Our Lent journey is 40 days, long enough for us to slow down and pay attention to this final covenant being enacted. Because this covenant is the covenant of all covenants. God with us. God willing to suffer. God willing to die. God willing to enter into our situation to continue the invitation to enter into a peculiar peoplehood who will reveal God to the world as those willing to love each other as he loved us in Jesus Christ. God has done this, and it is marvelous to behold. The exit door is closed. God is with us in good times and in bad times. No contracts, just covenants.
Once again, thank you for joining us for this special time of worship. Thank you to our special speaker that we had this morning. It's a privilege and a delight. Time keeps moving quicker, doesn't it? Please join me in the benediction for today for this sending blessing. Only when a seed lets go does new life arise from it. And here is the secret planted deep within the earth. This change happens not once for us, but many times over. Go into this work, aware of the times of letting go that have allowed for new life to come. Go, aware of the deep growth stirring within you. Amen. Blessings to you, everyone. For this last little bit here this morning, which in the past we have been calling our chit-chat time, we're going to give you a quick tour of the church again. There's the new TV monitors that I've been mounted up at the front of the church. And here is the front of the church as it has been designed for our Lenten service. 
The speakers that are up top, those are new. There's the other TV monitor on the other side, and we'll just keep spinning around here. These speakers that are halfway back in the sanctuary, that has the effect of making the sound equal all throughout the sanctuary no matter where you're sitting. We've been able to listen to that in action. And then as we get to the back here, we can see how hard these trustees have been working. There's a couple of scaffolds, and there's the TV that the pastor gets to look at. Maybe I'll put some kind of game on there while I'm up there preaching sometime. Thank you to the trustees for their hard work. And there is the extension of our sound panel, or our sound booth, rather. You saw at the conclusion of last Sunday's service that canoe that was made by Kevin Rogie. Well, he also did this work here on this sound booth. Did a great job. Really grateful for the work that the trustees have put in. Can't wait till you can all see it again at Lowellville Mennonite Church.